Hello, hey, Boomer listeners. My name is Wendy Green, and this is the sixth episode of Hey, Boomer. Every week, there are new people joining us. And one of the things that we really love is when we know who's there. So if you can just take a moment and say hello to us from the comments, we really appreciate that. And then as we go forward in the conversation, um, you know, Hey Boomer is all about having conversations. And so um, if you want to join in the conversation in any way that makes sense to you, whether you want to be words of encouragement or you just want to say hello, or you have any questions for me or for my guest, please go ahead and put them into the comments. We love that. So today, as you saw in the write-up, my guest is Kate Sally Palmer, and I'm going to introduce you to her in a moment. But Kate is going to talk a little bit about her career from political cartoonist to um, being a writer of children's books. And so it made me start to think a little bit about the children's books that I read with my kids and that really brought us enjoyment. And one of my favorite times as a mom was when I would cuddle up with one child under each arm and we would read books together before bedtime. And I remember one of my son's favorite books was The Little Engine That Could. And he loved the whole idea of, I think I can, I think I can. And I think he still can. He's amazing going forward. My daughter used to love the Junie B. Jones books. Of course, that was a little bit older um, time. And she really loved the troubles and the tribulations that Junie B. Jones would get into. And we, all of us, used to love the Shel Silverstein books uh, and the wonderful poems and the wonderful pictures. And I think one of the things that make Kate's books really stand out are some of the illustrations that you'll see as we go through this um, story. And so the illustrations and the lessons all come together to make uh, an, a platform that the kids can really relate to. So I'm excited to share this with you and let me bring Kate on and do a brief introduction. Hi, Kate. Hello, Wendy. How are you? I'm great. Good to see you. Thanks for joining. Thank you. So Kate Sally Palmer has mastered the art of teaching children through children's books and colorful illustrations and most of what she teaches them about is our history that has happened here in South Carolina. Kate is a native South Carolinian, born and raised in Orangeburg, South Carolina. She started doing political cartoons at the Greenville News in 1975. And in 1980, she became nationally syndicated, one of a handful of women political cartoonists even today. In the late 80s, Kate made the switch to picture books for children, combining her love of illustration, her curiosity about South Carolina history, and her love of storytelling. Throughout the 90s, Kate illustrated more than 20 books for big publishers. And in 1998, she and her husband formed a small publishing company called the War Branch Press. They've, Kate has produced 10 titles for War Branch Press, a reissue of Simon & Schuster's A Gracious Plenty, The Pink House, which you'll hear about, The Little Chairs, we'll talk about that, Palmetto Symbol of Courage, Francis Marion and the Legend of the Swamp Fox, which her son James illustrated, uh, Almost Invisible, Black Patriots of the American Revolution, The First South Carolinians, I know Santa very well, Hosty, and 2016 Race for the Presidency, which was a coloring book for the 2016 presidential campaign featuring about 17 candidates. I'm sorry, I missed that one. <laughs> uh, in 2019, the University of South Carolina Press published The Lady of Kofa Tchecki. Did I say that right? Okay. <laughs> This is a story Kate wrote recounting the meeting of a Native American chief 
a woman in South Carolina with the explorer Hernando de Soto. Also in 19, Kate finished a graphic novel of Jane Austen's book, Pride and Prejudice. This one has not been published yet, yet. <laughs> And in 2006, the Clemson University Digital Press published her memoir, Cartoon Retrospective, Growing Up Cartoonist in the Baby Boom South, which I read and loved. It was a fabulous book. So, Kate, thank you for joining me today. Oh, you're welcome. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Before we get started, can you just tell me how long your family has been in South Carolina? My family? Um, well, 1735 was what um, the, they they go back to. They founded the city of Orangeburg. They founded it. Oh wow! Okay, they founded the city of Orangeburg. Mm -hmm. So, I just think it would be interesting if you could start with a, just a brief history of your childhood through, from Orangeburg to political cartoonist, and then we can go from there. Oh, goodness. Um, <laughs> brief my, history, yeah, right? <laughs> brief history of my whole life. Um, yeah. Uh, well, I, I grew up in Orangeburg and went to, um, I, we lived um, we lived on a farm. My fa father was a farm manager for a while, and we lived on a farm. Um, and that was fun until I was about five. And then we moved into town and um, went to um, the elementary schools where I was um um, a little unfocused and remained that way. Um, and um, the elementary, let's see, the elementary school, high school, high school. I was, I, I was, um, I was kind of like the school artist. We didn't have art in our school, um, at either elementary school or high school. And um, but I was kind of like the resident artist. And so I, I did illustrations for the. Um, for the uh, annual and things like that. And, um, and uh, when I was 14, the state newspaper got in touch with me. The um, sports editor wanted to do a column about Frank Howard and he wanted me to do a caricature of Frank Howard. I don't know where he got my name or why they you know, wanted me to do it. But um, I mean, they had a perfectly good cartoonist at the state. Um, anyway, so, I did a picture of Frank Howard, and it was published in the state when I was 14. Um, went to went to the University of South Carolina, uh, majored in elementary education because you didn't have to take math. And um, so I um, I did a cartoon strip for the um, for the newspaper, the school newspaper called Terrible Tom and the Boys. And they Terrible Tom and the Boys were like a gang of superheroes. And they went around um, solving mysteries and things like that. And um, and it was actually the dean of men, the dean of women, and the president of the school. And I had I did their caricatures, but I dressed them as superheroes in capes and tights and things like that. And um, it was it was actually pretty popular. I was um I was on the elevator one night um, taking the strip to um, the newspaper office. And a and a, a male student was on the was on the um, elevator with me, and he said, "Do you?" He said, "That's terrible, Tom and the boys." And I said, "Yep." And he said, um, "Do you know the person who does that?" And I said, "I am the person who does that." And he said, "He said a girl," and then the elevator doors opened and he got off, and I I, I you know didn't know what to say. Yep, girl. I don't know. I don't know if he knew many many men who signed their names Kate Palmer, Kate Sally, Kate Sally, that was my name then. That's that's why I have three names. Um, I, I, I signed my, my professional name is Kate Sally Palmer because I was raised Kate Sally. And um, when I started doing cartoons at the Greenville News, um, they were controversial and I didn't think the Palmers should have to shoulder the whole burden of, of, um, of me being in their family. So. I said the Sallys need to need to step up and share the and share it. So I I put the I put Sally in my name and um, then um, uh, gosh I did yeah. cartoons for them. But... Yeah, no that. So whatever happened to Terrible Tom and the Boys? Uh, 
actually, um, the husband of one of the editors, newspaper editors, preserved um, preserved it on on uh, digitally, and I still have it. Oh, it was just horrible. I mean, it was just terribly drawn. It was it was the most amateurish thing you've ever seen. I'm I'm embarrassed to look at it now. I really am. Um, of course, I'm still embarrassed to look at some of my other work too, but. Uh, but you were obviously good enough at 14 that the state newspaper <laughs> asked you well, to draw it. Wasn't, it wasn't a good caricature. It was just, it was just a caricature. But anyway. Um, I, so uh, how did you make the transition from political cartooning to children's storybook writer? Well, I was, um, I was the second woman to join the Association of American Editorial Cartoonists. And um, so, and so I, I was rocking along at the Greenville News doing um, happy. Well, not yeah. It was it got it got harder and harder. And um, and so um, I I gave it up and um, and decided that I would I would try to pursue another avenue to tell stories and and draw pictures. And um, I, my friends were school teachers. They they took me into a children's bookstore, and I was not interested in children's books, or I didn't think I was. Um, but um, I uh, looked across the store, and there, there was a, the cover of a children's book that looked like it had been done by a cartoonist friend of mine. And I went over there, and it wasn't, but it was it was done by Stephen Ca uh, Gamel, um, and um, it was called The Relatives Came. It was written by Cynthia Rylant. And it was one of the best. It was one one of the best uh, children's books I could have picked up just to to learn from. And um, I I read it and I liked it and I thought, gosh, I would love to do something like this. And um, so I I checked out every single book that I could in the Clemson Library about what makes a good picture book. Um, and there are there were a lot of them. Um, and um, so I, I wrote the big house. And so, so let's let me share my screen so you can people can start to see some of these pictures. OK. And um, and I have to say, you know, I talked about my some of my favorite books as a um, when I was a mom. But I have to say that as you hear the stories of some of these um, books, I think you all might find that you have some new favorites. So The Pink House, that was your first one. That was my first one was The Pink House. And I sent a pencil drawings of it to out to 10 publishers and got rejected. And then I sent them out to 10 more publishers and um, and didn't hear back from two. So I called I called Simon and Schuster. You're not supposed to do that. You're not supposed to call them. But I called Simon and Schuster and they said they wanted to buy it. And um, so, but they, they weren't sure of my art. Nobody's sure of my art. I'm not sure of my art. Um, but anyway, they, they wanted me to do another book, illustrate another book before I, um, before I, I illustrated Pink House for them. So I illustrated uh, um, how many feet in the bed by Diane Johnston Ham, and um, and they they liked it. They liked what I had done. So they, I, by while I was illustrate while I was illustrating that book, I wrote another book, A Gracious Plenty, and um, they liked that one um, better because it was um, didn't need as much editing. So um, I did. I. I um, I, I wrote and illustrated uh, a gracious plenty for them. And Which we don't have a picture of, but can you tell us a little bit about the story of the pink house? The pink house. Yes. It's um, it's a story of my family's annual beach trip um, to Edisto beach. And um, my, my sister, um, my sister's husband's family owns a, or owned a, a, um, an old beach house and it was painted pink. And, um, and uh, it was like Pepto-Bismol pink every, every, yeah, every, um, 
every every year i think it got painted again and uh always pink and it was um so it was it was very big it was a big house on the edisto on edisto island um until they started building these really monster houses um it was everybody you know uh, we thought it was very roomy but it turned out to be not so big um when, when you think about all the really big houses they're building now and um but anyway we would we would go down there and there was enough um there was enough room in the house for everybody to for you know me my children my two sisters um and um uh, my my niece and my um my um brothers-in-law my my brother his wife and their three children there was enough room for everybody and um not that everybody got a whole got a bed to the to themselves but it, that that didn't matter um and so uh we this this house is it, this this book is about the the things that we did at the pink house and um and i think i, I don't know if you still go to the pink house but i i look at your, sally your daughter's um facebook and it sounds like y'all still go to the beach we do vacations no. well we don't go to the pink house because it's been torn down Oh yeah, it it was sold and torn down just a couple of years ago. Oh, and how sad. There's, there's a new there's a new monster house on that lot right now. Well, I'm glad that you preserved the story of the pink house. Then I am too. I am yeah. too. So the next one that we have is the little chairs. The you little chairs. Yes, this is a story that is based on a story that my mother told me about her and my father. Daddy um, used to have times when he would sit in a dark corner and be, and he was not, and just not talk. And he would be, he would be sad. And, um, and mama said that, that, and he wouldn't go to the doctor or anything. Um, so uh, mama said that one time she brought him a little wooden chair and she told him she wanted him to paint it. Well, he picked out the color. It was brown. Um, and um, he painted it and he called her to come look at it. And she said, paint it again. And um, so he painted it again. And um, so he every time he'd paint it, he'd call her to look at it. And she'd, she'd say it needs another coat and she, because she'd look at him. And um, if he wasn't ready to, you know, eat supper or fill, uh, join, rejoin the family, you know, um, she would say so paint it again and um so he fain he painted that chair seven times hmm. and um mama said he felt a little bit better after he was finished um in in this book i've got the the different chairs are they're more colorful i've got a yellow chair a green chair a red chair a blue chair and um and the father is sad and the mother says um she was frightened and she says what what's making you sad did i do something to make you sad because everybody always thinks it's their fault mm -hmm. and um so he said no no I, I think i'm making myself sad and i don't know how to stop it and um and she said that she in the and then it says that the mother wanted to help the daddy whom she loved, but she knew that she hadn't made him sad and there was nothing, she couldn't make him happy again, but she did want to help him stop sitting in his dark corner with pretty days gone to waste outside. So she brought him a little chair, the first little chair and, um, and per persuaded him to, um, to paint it for her. And, um, so he painted it yellow and, and it, the, the, the color reminded him of, of a butterfly and, and gave him, you know, made him think of happy things. And then the, the, he, the paint was so smooth and, and the, um, he followed the paint as it went on and it was bright and, and, um, that happened. And so he called the mama to come look at it and she looked at it and she said, paint it again. And, um, uh, he said, paint it again. And she said, yes, it needs another coat. Um, and so he painted it again. And then the next day he came in and sat in his little, his, his dark place again. And she brought him a little, another little chair, and told him to that she wanted to paint him to paint this one blue, and it, the blue paint reminded him of a distant mountain and a bike he once had, and um, so um, he painted it blue, and his eyes followed the paint, and it was very smooth and and uh, 
and bright. And uh, so then he called the mama to come look at it, and she said, "Paint it again." And that, and he he did, and that that, that happened again with a. Uh, a red chair, and the last one was a little green chair, and he painted it until it was shining like trees after a storm. And um, and then she said, "I think this job is over, almost over." You uh, know, and he um, and the last picture, there the family's hugging, and I, there's two children in the family, but I don't mention them at all. You see their pictures; um, they're they're in the illustrations, but but you, they're they're not part of the. Um, the dynamic between the mother and the father and um but the whole family is hugging at the end and he's it said it was it was time for supper and he was hungry and um and then at the end i've got the little picture of all the little wooden chairs on the on the porch you know and um that that book this book children love this book um they i get it's the only book that i read at schools when i when i do school talks it's the only one that gets spontaneous applause and they, they love it but, well um, hearing you tell it I, I i get chills you know i i want this book for myself i mean maybe i'll share it with the kids but i i mean I, it's what it's a wonderful story because we all have been in those dark places and sure. what a wonderful my at my editor at simon and schuster however didn't want it because she said it was about inexplicable sadness and children don't understand that. Oh, they do. My friend who's a teacher said, she said children sometimes suffer from it. Mm -hmm. Not, you know, and, or if they don't, they have family members who do. And um, so. Yeah, children do, we all do. I love that. Thank oh, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you. So then you transition from no, yes. Personal stories to stories about more South Carolina history. Um, the third grade teachers used to approach us at conferences and they would say, we need some collateral reading, some, some, uh, some uh, um, supplemental reading for uh, our children to um, some resources for our children to read uh, about South Carolina Revolutionary War history in South Carolina because they were they had to teach Revolutionary War history in South Carolina and there were no um, there was there were no resources for them for the children to read. So I did the research and um, found out they, they didn't know I, I would point to the palmetto trees that were pictured in the pink house and um, and uh, children didn't know that it was a palmetto tree and they didn't know what was special about it and everything. So I realized I didn't know that much either. So I did like I had to do a lot of research on it. And it was a very, it's a very interesting story. It um it it started on June 28th, 1776. The uh, British uh, British fleet uh came to attack the city of Charleston and to capture Charleston for the King of England. Um this was a week before the Declaration of Independence was adopted. Wow. And uh, so the, the, the soldiers of the 2nd Regiment, 2nd South Carolina Regiment, were in a little fort that they had built. They had, they had known the ships were coming, and they had uh, only a few months to build this fort. And um, they built it out of palmetto logs because palmetto trees grow abundantly on South Carolina sea islands, and they, it, was on, it was on Sullivan's Island that this, that this fort was built. And um, so they have, they built a two walls, two 10 foot walls. And in between they patched, they, they packed um, beach sand and marsh mud. And um, so they were 10 feet tall and um, 16 feet wide, the walls. And they, they um, only got three walls made because they ran out of time and they meant to make it enclosed fort, but they only, but they, the fort had no back wall. But um, all the walls faced the ocean. And um, when the British fleet arrived, they would they would they circled around and, and they they had they had 300 guns on those ships. There were nine British warships and they had 300 guns. The fort had 31 guns mm. and 400 men inside the fort. One of them was Francis Marion, the Swamp Fox. 
And um, so the, um, they didn't have a lot of uh, gunpowder or anything like that. And so they, 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 it was, a, it was a David, David and Goliath kind of thing, you know? Um, mm -hmm. uh, so the, when the British ships fired the cannonballs at the fort, instead of, instead of knocking it down, the cannonball, cannonball sank into this soft spongy palmetto logs and got wedged in the beach sand and marsh mud. And so um, the the soldiers inside the fort had time to aim their guns, and they they aimed at the rigging and the um, masts of the ships to try to disable them. Because if they couldn't sail, they couldn't move. Back then, they of course they had no they had no motors or anything, and so um, if they if they couldn't sail, they were dead in the water. And um, so at at the um, they were they were pretty badly damaged and they finally uh, but toward sundown they left while they could still sail and um the the second regiment had won the battle and um said the the british did not capture charleston that 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 year 1776 they came back in 1780 and did capture charleston um from the land um they they went over land came up from savannah and capture but, but because of the great protection that the palmetto trees gave, mm -hmm. they became our state tree here in South Carolina. They became our state tree, and every single symbol on our state flag dates back to that one day. Is that every, right? Yes. the 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 crescent is is a um, is the same as the crescent that was worn by the Second Regiment on the front of their helmets. They had, a, they had a crescent on the front of their helmets and they wanted to put that. Colonel Moultrie designed the flag and he wanted the color to be blue, the same color as the second regiment uniforms. And um, of course the first flag did not have a palmetto tree on it um, because they didn't know that the palmetto tree was gonna be the hero of the battle. <laughs> and, um, but they, um, governor of South Carolina, the president, they called him, where John Rutledge ordered a seal to be made after the battle. And um, on the front of the seal is a palmetto tree growing out of an oak stump. And the oak stump rep represents the British ships. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were made of oak. And um, the palmetto tree represents the fort, of course. And it commemorates the Declaration of Independence and everything. And, and so on the back of the seal is the state motto and the state motto is Dum Spiro Spero. And that means, while I breathe, I hope. And that dates back to the battle as well. While I breathe, I hope. So uh, our Wait. state motto, our state tree, our state, um, our state flag, everything dates back to that, um, to that one battle. I don't know if you can see any of these comments, Kate, but Tom Long says, do you remember he used your book for his eighth grade special ed students in social studies? <laughs> oh, hey, Tom. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. All right. So that you said, Francis Marion, the Swamp Fox was in this battle. So you yeah. wrote a book about him. I did. Um, my son had just done a, a, um, documentary for ETV about the Swamp Fox called Chasing the Swamp Fox. And, and I knew that the teachers were hungry for reading for the kids uh, in, in South Carolina Revolutionary War history. So um, I thought that would be a good thing for me to, of course, I didn't know anything about Francis Marion or the Swamp Fox or anything like that. Um, so I had to do a lot of research for this one. And I wrote the story and Jim, uh, James, my son, uh, illustrated it. And um, he did, it's all digital. James is a graphic artist in Atlanta. And he, um, the whole thing is, in digi is done digitally. And uh, the, the Swamp Fox uh, was, was born um, in Berkeley County, little, was a, he was very small when he was born, no bigger than a lobster, his father said. And um, and he um, he fought in the um, French and Indian War, and uh, he he was made a captain, I think, of the South Carolina in the South Carolina Second Regiment. And um, 
and then that that's when he was in the that's when he fought the um in the um fort and it actually it started out to be called fort sullivan but they changed the name of it um to fort moultrie because moultrie william moultrie was the um was was the commander in the fort so how did he get the name the swamp fox Oh, Bonaster Tarleton, a a brutal um, British um, colonel, um, was the commander of a group of um, soldiers called the Green Dragoons, and they were throughout South Carolina. They they wore green jackets and and they were dragoons. They that is they rode horses. Mm. They were on they were on horseback, and um, he, the Swamp Fox would would um, attack and then run. He would attack and then run, and um, the the dragoons chased the swamp fox and his men through the swamps um, for se seven hours one day, and um, could not could not find them, could not catch them, couldn't they just disappeared, and mm -hmm. um, and finally Tarleton said to his men, he said, "Let's go back and catch the gamecock." That was Thomas Sumter. He said, as for this old fox, the devil himself couldn't catch him. Wow. And so oh, when he called him that fox, everybody else started calling him the swamp fox. <laughs> That's a great, so many good stories. Mm -hmm. uh, we have one more, and this one is a total you know, change from a revolutionary war. Yeah. Tell me about this lady of Kofa to Cheki. I had to practice that for many days. Kofa to Cheki. I know it's really hard. Um, um, well, this is this is not it's not a legend because it really happened. Um, this this lady of Kofa to Cheki did indeed meet with um, Hernando de Soto. Um, I had done a book earlier called The uh, First South Carolinians, which is about the the native people of South Carolina, and. Um, and so we we were kind of familiar with the natives and and how they had how they had um lived and um and i read i i this this was published by the university of south carolina press and um they were insistent that that it be accurate um as far as the it, this took place during the mississippian period and they built mounds in, in that in that era in that period of time and um, nobody really knows what they did on top of the mounds or why the mounds were built but they they did spend years building mounds and um, so uh, there was so much I couldn't know that we do know that the lady was dressed in white she she had pearls around her neck she she put pearls around the neck of Hernando de Soto when he when he came. Um, I read scholarly paper after scholarly paper that they sent me, and uh, one was about the worldview of the people. And one of them, one of the things that they said was um, that they they thought of everything as a person, every living thing as a person, and the trees were tall people. Um, mm. So. I have this, I tell the story from the point of view of a river otter. So he doesn't know any more than I know. All he knows is he he knows the lady and he loves the lady. And um, he, he, he sees Hernando de Soto arrive. He hears, he hears the interpreter telling, talking with, with the, the people of the, of the town. And um, so, um, after after a while, Hernando de Soto. Um, well, he, they wanted precious metals and gems, which the the native people did not have in South Carolina, and um, they were frustrated. And the um, so the Spaniards um, kind of ransacked the village and um, wore out their welcome because the. the the natives had welcomed them to the into the um, given them food and lodging and all kinds of stuff. So um, anyway, when they left, they took the lady hostage um, 
along with several other people, um, some men to carry their, their, their burdens and everything. And um, so she, the legend, the legend, it's not really a legend. It actually happened. Um, but there's so little that can be known. There's three different endings to the story. Um, I, I read one that said that she, she escaped from the from from uh, Hernando de Soto's army and um, and went back to the village with uh, alone. One said she came one 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 in one ending she came with a she had escaped with a, a woman, another another native person, um, and another story said that she um, came back to the village with a man who who she married, and um, of course I just thought the the man, you know, she that she married was probably that. I thought that was the best ending. <laughs> <laughs> and so did your river otter, I'm sure. <laughs> river otter was happy, and he was happy to see her. Um, and at the end, she she he swims closer to her than than um than uh, he's ever swam to her before. And she puts out her hand and says, "Hello, otter." Aww. That's, the the book. That's so super creative. Okay, thank you. So I'm guessing that people listening to this would like to know where they can get some of these books. So I'm going to show your website. Oh, good. Morganfrost.com. Yeah. So any of the books can be ordered there, also on Amazon. Um, and my cat's on the table. Sorry. <laughs> she wants to be part of this story, too. <laughs> uh, yeah. So we talked the other day and well, first of all, I think, I don't know if you saw some of the comments. Can you see them? Okay. I can't see the comments. Okay. So some of the people like that, you know, Tiffany Joy Heron, she says, I'm so amazed by you. It's so great to see you and hear your voice. Oh, so, so I'm glad, glad to know that Tiffany's here. That's yeah. great. Yeah, Melinda Brown Long. Go away. Oh, hey, Melinda. She says she loves a gracious plenty. Um, she loves the stories that you're telling today. People that you don't know are also commenting and saying, oh, I wish I had grandchildren to share these books with. They're loving this history. So oh. everybody has really enjoyed this. Thank you. Well, um, one of the things that we talked about when we talked the other day was a takeaway from this. And I'm wondering if you can give us a takeaway of this wonderful journey that you've been on. Well, what I usually tell the children, a lot of times the children say that they want to, when I visit schools, they say they want to be um, an author, an artist or whatever. And, um, and I tell them to practice a little bit every single day, always write something every day. Or, or do some art every day and anything you do every day you'll get better at it and um and i said if, if you're not interested in writing or drawing find something that you that you do that you love to do and find a way to be able to do that and it'll make you happy and i think that's what you said when we talked that you know it wasn't hard for you to draw pictures yeah. because that's something you always love to do. Right. They would, they, they would ask me, is it hard to, to, um, to be a, a writer and an illustrator? And, and I say not for, no, it's not hard for me because that's like playing for me. I love to do it. Um, and, um, I mean, I would rather do that than anything. Almost. And, um, so, uh, but, you know, you just need to find something that that's easy for you to do that you um, that that you enjoy doing so much that it's like playing when you do it. Yeah, and like I said to you when we were chatting before we came on, you know, I as a kid always was like, I want to be Walter Cronkite. I want to be a broadcaster. You know, and and I'm you loving are. this. <laughs> so here I am, right? There you are. Here I am. So 
And I am always looking for other wonderful stories. Um, this has been an absolute joy. I could sit and listen to you for hours. Thank you, Wendy. Yeah. Um, if other people have stories that they would like to share on Hey Boomer that you think would be of interest to people, you can email me at heyboomer0413 at gmail.com. I would love to know that. Um, I also want to tell you about my guest for next Monday, which happens to be Memorial Day. I'm very excited about this. His name is Dr. Keith Goose Moncrief. <laughs> and he is a retired U.S. Air Force colonel. So Goose is his call sign as an aviator when he was in the Air Force. And uh, there's so many different things that he could talk about, but he wants to talk about and honor, obviously for Memorial Day, honor his, his troops and their families. He was really adamant about telling me that. It was not just about the troops, it's about the families too. And he's got a particular story that um, brought 35 different bases together for an operation in Saudi Arabia in 2007, something that many of us probably have not heard about. Um, so he's gonna tell us about that and how that worked and the leadership that it took to pull all of that together. So I think that's going to be, he's, he's very passionate about this. So I think that's going to be a really interesting um, conversation as well. So we all have stories to tell. So let's share stories. And Kate, thank you for your stories. I'm going to, I'm going to get that book about the chairs. I love that one. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you all for joining us. We will see you next week.